Hello, I'm Harold Allman from uh, TranslationData.com. Today I've got a uh, presentation by Mark Kegel. Mark's going to discuss how Scala Magic works on the JVM. It's uh, part two of his presentation. If you want to see the first part of the presentation, just check for the videos on this uh, channel. And uh, if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel by clicking on the button below. This instead of just instantiating. The because it used an implicit int on the square. Well, you might have some scope around it. Two right? space square. Maybe, yeah. Could have some oh, if you had scope around it, that's true. Yeah, then the factory would get access to In the main class itself, then that would get scoped underneath. Yeah. But that's a pattern that we haven't seen anywhere else where other classes have been instantiating other classes. Of course, we haven't had too much code like that. But that's really trippy. This is not a pattern that we've seen before. It I'm could also, um, the compiler could be doing an optimization, and so that, um, now it's doing it every time. Never mind, I was going to say maybe it's, maybe it's statically holding on to the single instance and reusing it, but it's not doing that either. Nope. Okay, so we've already got a little bit of weirdness. Uh, it's not weirdness that we're going to have to worry about, but if you were calling this code from Java, and you saw main dollar dot my int, and you called that from Java, and now all weird ads. It also means if you're watching the, you're doing a JVM watcher, you're going to get a f ton of um, instantiations off ints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, only if well, they have a dot squared. <laughs> yeah, only. If yeah, on, on all the ones that have dot squared. <laughs> but can Im imagine you're doing you're doing some sort of matrix mul matrix multiplication, right? Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. So yeah, there's there's a hundred by hundred. You've done that, you know, ten thousand times now. Okay, so here's our implicit int. It looks right. Here's our in pair implicit conversion, and it looks right. Um, but here's mult. And this is sort of the, the first major difference. Is so, that the one with the implicit? Well, there it is yeah, sitting out there yeah, defined. Okay. This is the function, right? But it's the call oh, that to go find that implicit. Though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So the implicit parameter is completely compiler time. Yes. And it is, but the, the distinction that I want to pull our eyes to is that mult is actually a function of three arguments. Mm -hmm. Right. But it has two parameter lists as far as Scala is concerned. So one of the features that, it's sort of a lesser known feature, but Scala does actually support function curry. Uh, but you have to explicitly call out which functions need to be together in order to do curry. So unlike Haskell, where you can sort of curry one thing at a time and then do the full application at the end, you actually can specify in Scala, uh, I want the first two parameters, then the third, then maybe plus the fourth and fifth and sixth. So you can have any number of parameter lists. The last will always be your implicit parameter list. Actually, not having multiple implicit parameter lists has been an issue. Um, but that is just one of the limitations of the language. Huh. But you can see that when the code is actually compiled down eventually, it really is just one method that has all of those things smushed together. It's not synthesizing stuff which is a little bit crazy, but my guess is that it would synthesize some kind of lambda if you were permitted. And we could probably prove that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's implicit param, which is our mult33, and we can see that the compiler just went off and found our implicit in up here. And it just inserted it magically. With our extension method, 2.square, it's calling this factory method and then calling square, which is kind of what we would expect. With the type conversion, which is code that we didn't really walk through, but it's uh, this tuple down here, and then we call mult of, of this tuple now. This works because we have an implicit conversion in scope from tuple into int to int. So the way that this code looks is we declare our tuple p, it calls the conversion of that tuple, and then molt on the whole thing, mm -hmm. which makes sense. All right. I have one quick question. Yeah. On the def extension method the two square, could you, uh, no, yeah. 
No, no, in, in this color code. Could you just drop the two and do just squared? And would that pick up the implicit eight? No. Yeah, you have nothing. Two is just an assertion of a value, right? Yeah. Until you offer a method to say, I want you to go look for something, how would it know to look for it? Could you just say int or? Uh... Now, you could turn that into a lambda by doing under, and you probably have to provide a type annotation so we know which class to go look in, and then dot squared. But you couldn't just drop the two because it would have no idea where that method was. And that method could exist anywhere. I think you said drop squared. No, no, no. Drop the two. Drop the yeah, two. Drop okay. Two. Right. So get the int uh, to be implicit from the the mm -hmm. two to be implicit That's from the implicit. No, no, mm -hmm. that doesn't work like that. Unless it's specifically allowed, it does not work. And in the case of extension methods like this, okay, this cannot be implicit. The the first set of parameters have to be explicit. There can be only one. Okay. So you can't just arbitrarily chuck methods on values, basically. Yeah, it so has this, to follow that pattern. This pattern is very well defined. Now, yeah. you can have that there can be only one and it must be explicit. You can have other implicit parameters <laughs> following this if you want. Yeah. Okay. So, that feels okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some well, definition I mean, of a sorry, feel a little dirty. <laughs> it feels a little dirty, like the compiler's going out and writing code for us, and it could grab anything. Like, what happens if we have multiple implicits in scope that are the same type? Which does it choose? Well, it turns out that's an error. That's an ambiguity error. So th there are some guardrails here, and that feels okay. So, just question on this sense then, like this card that we have that you had the bytecode stuff, right? Like this existing thing. When it runs through the JVM for a while, will all that disappear, hopefully? Yeah, it should. I mean, the hotspot should generate native code. Yeah, it should. Right. Well, well, so what so is what all? I mean, when you say it all it all disappears, what, so, what is your definition of all? So, like okay, the news? so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so sure. So my definition of all would be because everything's sort of marked final, right? Pretty much yeah. everywhere. Yeah. It would know that I can throw away all these wrappers, basically, mm -hmm. for the most part that I don't where I don't capture scope. Well, the hotspot compiler can do some of that, but it is limited to more of a Java understanding of the world, not the Scala. So we're the, up there where it was doing the new my int, mm -hmm. it's and then and, and obviously capturing the value and then later squares getting called. It might inline <coughs> squared into uh, it might be able to it could try an inline squared except that there's a in, new instance in the way so there's no way to inline it all the way back to the original point that called squared right. so there i don't i don't know i don't believe hotspots capable of making the leap going oh all instances are always called it's all constant around it i should be able to make a single instance and inline this straight down below to a direct end call i don't think hotspot makes those leaps because java doesn't have that kind of reasoning there's no like value wrappers basically in that case, yes. Okay. And, and the reason why is, again, he's like you said, you got to take it to the noun. You have to get to the noun so that you can enable all of the verbing. If you don't have a noun, you can't have your verbs. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a horrible language. Or horrible language. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think Jonathan brought up an interesting question: Is can this feature implicit be abused? <laughs> <laughs> And the, ab the answer is absolutely yes and in the best possible way. Okay, so we are all familiar, presumably, with uh, the regular OO conventions of languages like Java and Python and now Scala. We've seen how we have classes and traits and objects. Well, what happens if we're in a situation, and I've been in this situation, uh, where we have a class that's marked final? You know, in, in typical OO land, the way that you deal with this is that you write a really nasty letter to the original developer and you check out their code on GitHub and you change final and you remove it and you rebuild their code and now you've got dependency help because you've got two different versions of the code out there just because you wanted to extend their bloody damn class. Like string, for example. Like string, for example. Okay. So, I mean, that brings up all kinds of interesting questions like, really, should you be extending those classes? Is there a safer way of doing this? Is there a type-safe way 
of adding behavior to data and classes that already exist. And it took some really smart guys a really long time to finally arrive at an answer that was acceptable, and the answer is yes. I only know of like one or two other languages that even offer this, but they're called type classes. You can, in Scala, mimic type classes. So let's look at what a type class is. Uh, it's sort of, uh, I like to refer to it as ad hoc polymorphism. Uh, so for example, let's assume that we had an int. And let's assume that we didn't it's have, oh okay. going on with the, it's like it's nighttime, I must do the, oh, it was an hour, that's why. Oh, yeah, it's been an hour, <laughs> okay. Let's assume that we didn't have OO, but we did have implicit. So how would I implement toString in a language like that? In a language like Haskell, because Haskell actually has type classes. So let's imagine that we introduce uh, a trait show that accepts an arbitrary type and defines a method show that for that arbitrary type will convert it into a string. Promises that given an instance of t, I can hand you back a string. And by the way, this type class actually exists in the library Scala Z, which is why I named it show. <laughs> Along with uh, defined primitive or uh, instances of show for all the primitive types. So what we can do is we can define an implicit for show of int that knows how to four concrete types of int convert that into a string. And for every type out there, we can define a rule that says, I know how to convert this into a string. And the compiler knows how to just go out and find something of show of my type and promises to just hand me that back as long as it's unambiguous, right? This is the essence of the type class pattern. So for example, if I define show of int and show of string and show of double, and we'll look at that in just a second, and I define my show method here as taking a T and requiring of the compiler that it can prove to me that it can hand me a show of T, then I am allowed to call on that type class instance ev.show of T. And I know that I will get back a string. So for example, show of one down here, what the compiler is going to have to go do is prove that there is a show of int. And because there is a show of int in the scope, you can hand it back. Things get more interesting when we have complex or compound types, like tuple. So for show of tuple here, it gets, uh, this is where the abuse comes from because, well, this can be recursive, as deep as you'd like. So a show of tuple well, it says, of course I can hand you back a show of tuple as long as I have shows of A and B. So it does recursive destructuring of the type. Oh, very nice. Now, we looked at all of this in the, in the shapeless land, and the follow-on modules look at shapeless. But now we're going to look at how it's actually compiled underneath. So let's... I, before, you, before you jump off, could you... Explain, please, why you have new show over there with the method. New show? So on the right well, side. All the way to the right. Yeah. On that line. On the line you're on right there. And no, yeah. uh, one line but to the end. That? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Why are we defining that? Uh oh. What is the reasoning behind a new, that? It's just a new derived type of show. Yeah, so we have to derive an instance of show. So that's at sort of run. It's a specialization of show, just like he's got new show int, new show okay. string, new. So I don't need to do anything special to do a show of int, right? Right. I can just define that as, as a vowel. Mm -hmm. But I need some kind of generator for a show of tuple. In that I can promise to hand you one of these, but I need to know how to build it up first. Mm -hmm. Ah, I see. Okay, got it. So that's different than the other ones because, okay. So. Yeah, so the, the order of operations is a little bit weird, but it's actually uh, one to one equivalent to prolog. All kinds of fun. So this, this is a rule, and this is sort of the, the proof of that rule, right, if you will. Uh, it's just like the other ones, except the tuple 2 is implied 
It's an implicit value without actually. I mean, there, there's a two for two type. It's just implied. You could put it in front of that. No, no. I mean, the, the syntax has to be there. No, well, I mean, no. What he's saying is, take parentheses a comma b parentheses and remove it, and you can put tuple two open square brace a comma b close square brace, and it's the same thing. Yeah. Does that do you, do you follow what I just said? That part right. I don't have a problem. Uh, it's more along the lines of the new keyword with a new thing being returned. But I get why that needs to be there. So well, okay. So new show shows in. the traits. You have to use new. Right. Oh, I see. You're wondering why in new int case, in the new show int, you didn't have to do all this extra stuff? Yes. Ah, Because okay. there are no parameters to the int version of the implicit, right? Show int right. didn't take any parameters, right. therefore it can be a val. Yeah. But the case where we needed the parameter of the implicit, it has to take parameters and therefore it can't just be a new class. It's got to be the def. Is that? Yeah, yeah. Because that's, the that's type is asking. variable. Okay. Int is constant, but the types are variable in the tuple. Right? Well, what you're saying to do the conversion for int, you, you, did, you didn't need anything extra. But in order to do the uh, for, for tuple, you needed that extra. Parameter. You need, the, you need yeah. the two parameters to tell you what the types are of the but, yeah. tuple. Is that what uh, you're saying? I, I think. Because there's no generic show for a. Right. right. So you have to create a new instance of it to call show. To that. I don't Forget know that, that part. That <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, our first crash. Yeah. Well, plus it's all null. Look at that. Oh. You got null in Scala. Oh, oh I got null. It's the application. Oh, that's, that's the compiler. Oh. It's the application. Oh, that's. Oh, that's argument. He didn't like it. All right. There's Java P or something where you can pass an argument to it. It'll show you the decompiled thing. Yeah. Something like that. Or Okay. In the same format. So, as it turns out, all of the magic here is being done at object instantiation, which I guess makes sense. Oh, thank you for coming. See you. Yeah. Uh, so, show of one is calling a box and then doing a show of int. What was the question of the concern? Oh, right, because show of int actually generates me my. Yeah. Okay, that's bizarre. Oh, but it has to be an object because it's a trait. There's no. But shouldn't there be an interface there that. Weird. Okay. Yeah. So I do have this interface, but it's somehow thinking of everything as an object rather than as an instance of show. Really weird. The show int should be a type show, right? That's how we've defined it. It's actually an object right now. Is this not just a... Okay. Okay. Okay, so the viewer is screwed. screwed. Yeah. <laughs> it really is a type show. This decompiler is just unhappy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. We're hitting another one of those. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm not too worried. We were hitting that with object constructors last time. Instance yeah. constructors. So wherever we see object here, it's probably show of show. Uh huh. Okay. So this is giving my, my show of in. And. I'm going to need a show of it if I'm going to call show on this one. And so this dot show, right, okay. So I, I, this show gets the one, and it gets this guy, and now it can call the code. Because it's going to call the dot show. That all makes sense. So it's going to do the same thing for here for puzzle, and the same thing for 2.0. The real interesting thing that happens is, what happens if we have multiple tuples like this? What is going to get sent Yeah, so two tuples. That's funny. And that's the two. Uh -huh. Okay, so we get a tuple. And we get a tuple of the tuple, which makes sense. <laughs> and we get one. And we get another tuple. And we get a tuple. Okay, so we've instantiated our tuple the right way. 
So we're not doing anything special for the object that we're passing down. So if we are doing anything special, it's going to be in the instance of show that we're deriving. So, do we do, do we synthesize anything interesting that way? So it turns out, yes, yes we do. Because we are calling show tuple, and into, into that, we are passing show in as the first, is how to print A, or, or the left thing. And into the right side, we pass another instance of show tuple. And then we pass a show string, and then we pass uh, a show double. Yeah. All of that magic was put together by the compiler. It knew what order to, to pass that in. So it, it handled the recursive types, basically. Yep. And this could be nested arbitrarily. Like, those tuples could be... Any level of depth. Any, any depth level. Okay, it's 9 o'clock. If we want to look at how the shapeless stuff is done, we certainly can. Uh, otherwise, folks are, are certainly free to go. Uh, so, well, before everyone goes, I want to make a general announcement. Oh, yeah. If you don't mind, pause up. Okay, so the improving uh, is moving, and so there will not be another, there will not be an October meeting. Um, it's going to be canceled. Um, there, and then they'll be in their new facility in Plano, up near the shops at Legacy, um, and we'll be meeting there in November. And so... Uh, so that means don't come here before checking the meetup. <laughs> Check the meetup. <laughs> a bunch of people just show up without checking the meetup on the assumption we're meeting, and we're not here. <laughs> Can I make a little thing as well? So was, yeah, sure, fire. Yeah, um, well. So I'm part of the Dallas Functional User Group. Uh, so we meet sort of the last Monday of every, every month. Um, this month we're not going to be here, same reason, basically. And uh, we're going to try and do like a virtual meetup. So check us out, Dallas Functional Programmers. You just go on the meetup page and See there, we'll schedule something, we'll know more about what we're talking about the next week or two, or next week or so. So we're trying to do some stuff with some uh, other meetup group in Knoxville, so we'll see how that goes as well. And if you want to short circuit that even a little bit more, go to tonight's meetup and post that you're okay. doing that and put the link there because everyone knows where to go for that. That yeah. makes the leap off to yours easy. Okay, cool. Yep. Cool, thank you. Oh, and another announcement, I will post a link to this video <laughs> once I get it produced in like about two or three weeks. Cool. Awesome. On the site. And uh, in case nobody knows, uh, I will be giving a workshop presentation just sort of on the, the intro to Scala at the Containerize This Conference. It's going to be held, I want to say, the, the 29th of September. It's going to be like the last weekend in, in, in September. Registration is free up until like the 15th. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go, please do. Tickets are open. Will you post that on the meetup? Yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah. That'll be good. So, it's, like, I want to see the first time I've heard of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like that. yeah, I know. I, I got a random invite. So. <laughs> good. Yeah, put those on the meetup, then that's the short circuit, too. Yeah, yeah. Because I think I'd like to go to that. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, yeah, so yeah, you, you, want to keep, you want to keep resumed, and then if you got to go, head yeah. on out. Okay, cool. So, this, we did a, a presentation on Shapeless before and all of the really, really cool, nasty things that you can do in Shapeless to throw off your uh, coding books. Um, <laughs> yeah, and job secure your current position. <laughs> yep. Okay, so one of the primitive constructs of, of Shapeless is the idea of the H list. And an H list is a list that keeps track of the individual types of the elements in the list. So th this is a, it's, a statically known construction. Because when you put together a list of int, you might have any number of listed ints, and each individual int, because there's subtyping involved, could be like some random subtype of int. But when you put together an H list, you actually know at compile time the full types of everything involved. So that's what this construction is right here, where we have Dallas and part of pi and then two, and then an h -line. And what this allows us to do is then do things like polymaths. So like in a regular list, I can say list.map and map that function across. But that is, in the parlance of Scala, a monomorphic function, a function that lives over one type. With shapeless, I can define functions that 
oh, thank you guys, uh, are polymorphic functions. Not in the OO sense, but in the sense of I can operate over any set of types that are in that list in a, in a well-defined way. So, for example, polyfunk here says, hey, if I encounter an int, then square it. If I encounter a string, then uppercase it. And if I encounter anything else, then just hand me that back. So what would I expect if I map polyfunk across hlist? Well, I would expect in all caps Dallas, I would expect this to be as it is, and I would expect four right here. The real question is, one, how the hell does this work? And what is going to be generated? Well, if we remember from what our type class instance stuff looked like, it should look very similar. So our compilation is a little bit more complicated because we have to pull in a chain list. But let's just see. Okay. So we can see that in the constructor the same thing is happening. We're, we're instantiating the, the H list and the mapped H list down here. Uh, but now we've got some really nasty types involved. And the reason we have really nasty types is that this is the only way of holding on to all of the type information in the system, uh. unfortunately. And so this is another instance of colon colon, but this is a colon colon that lives up in shapeless land. It's not the one that lives as part of Scala Free Death. So here we've got colon colon of string, which is nested of colon colon of tuple two, which is nested of colon colon of object, and then finally h nil. And then we have some magic stuff that we're going to eventually invoke, which is the h list pops, which takes itself an h list. Oh god, this is getting horrible. <laughs> so here is our... It's nested types followed by nested methods, it looks like. Which is how all of this is accomplished, by the way. Wow. You just, you just keep nesting. Yeah. So is the, is the, is the unraveling, I guess, if that's what I could call it, is that done by the compiler completely? Or yeah. is... Okay. Yeah, you have to define base cases and the recursive case, or an inductive case. Yeah. But then the rest can be handled by the compiler. And so what it's doing is it's concretely mapping out all the pathways, essentially. Yep. Yeah. Which is damn nice, given the efficiency of the um, representing the information. But it looks to me like it's constructing this in reverse. So it's it's got a tuple, or it's got an h nil at the base, oh. and then a two, and then our tuple, and then our dallas. Uh huh. Just kind of interesting. So it's well, that's the same way lists work. But it, yeah, right. I the in, the end result that Dallas had to be yep. last because it's at the head, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's true. It's, it is going to be yep. right along. Okay, so that makes sense. It just looks really good. Uh huh. All right. So what does our map look like? So we should expect this to be reversed as well. Huh. So here's, here's our sum h list, works. and we're mapping. But at this point, it's now mapping in, and so what is the parameter to the map? Oh, so here's our our poly, which exists as its companion method. That makes sense. And then we're synthesizing an H list mapper, and then we're calling at string, which is Dallas, right? So now all of a sudden we're going the other way. Yeah. And now we have a mapper of one, and we're calling default because, well, we didn't have a case for the tuple. Oh, yeah. And now we're calling at int. Which is the two, correct? Which is the two. Okay. Which is the final one. Yeah. So all of that got synthesized from this object with these implicits being mapped across that H list. Yeah so, it, yeah, so it's just literally taking 
the permutations and applying uh, and, and writing them out explicitly in JVM mode. Yep. Okay. Just pretty damned. It is. So are there limitations on how far the compile, I mean, how much code the compiler will generate? Are there any limitations That's in the number of parameters or any, anything like that on the I JVM? I think that there is actually. There. So the, the bigger limitations is that the more implicits that you generate. Uh, <laughs> compile time? <laughs> yeah, so the, the more parameters in your list, uh, the, the compile time cost goes exponential yes. in the number yeah. of parameters you have. That. And some of the uh, the shapeless things take quite a few different. Oh, no, no. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you can end up with really, really bad, like, I don't know why, but somebody had like 20 fields in their case class. And then they were running through, like, they had to pull in shapeless stuff like seven or eight different times. And it was basically going to have to boil the oceans to compile it. <laughs> I don't know why they were doing it, but and you can actually end up in situations. So, like I know the S codec guys because they rely on a lot of the same mechanisms. They swapped the order of two of the implicits, and it went from exponential to basically linear in their compile time. It was you really have to know what the compiler is doing underneath yeah. to, to make it right. Okay, so there's part one. Here's part two. Part two, to me, is more interesting. I was just going to head in that direction last time. <laughs> <laughs> so this, we also looked at this in, in the shapeless land. Uh, you don't just get each list with shapeless. You actually get a way to, to completely destructure and think about tuples and case classes and records, which is this thing right here, mm -hmm. as sort of the same thing. So in Haskell, there's a thing called everywhere, which if, if you have a, a sort of a closed ADT, you can say, uh, say you have a tree which is defined as leaves and nodes, which is closed. It would be a sealed tree here. You can say that for every node, just everywhere there's a node, uh, replace it with something else. You can just say that in Haskell, and it's really nice. Because of shapeless, you can do the same thing here. You can actually derive type classes if you want. Really, really neat. So what this is doing is it's defining a new type, case class person. It is getting the label generic of person, which underneath uh, does some macro magic. But what it allows you to do is get the record type of a product, which is what person is. So that if you wanted, you could statically refer to the individual named fields. It's one of the uh, pieces of functionality that you get. Swap things out, reorder them, replace them, and then rehydrate a different case class if you so choose, or the same one. So in this particular case, we turn it into a marked record, which we're just going to look at the, the decompiled thing of. Uh, here we have a gym record. Which this is the way of sort of putting together a record, but then I can hydrate a person from this code right here, which is kind of cool. That's pretty cool. So why would you ever use this? Uh, I assume the slick go in this direction. I don't think so. Okay. Let's see. So is this all in? Is you this the particular part at compile time only, or like will it be brought in at run time? Compile time only. Okay, that's the big thing I was going to yeah, ask. Yeah, it is that's type cool. safe. Okay, that's pretty neat. So here's a thing that I wrote up. Uh, if you haven't used play JSON, it derives a type class for you that handles taking your case class and converting it into JSON. We actually had an instance where the default macro handles options by turning nuns into an omitted key. So it won't actually appear in the output if it's null. Does that make sense? Oh, well, we had an instance. Did you, want, did you want a null or what? Yeah, we, we had an instance that wanted the output null. 
And it turns out there's actually no way short of modifying no, the macro. No, you mean J nothing? Or in other words, are you talking about null in JSON, in JSON world? Yeah. Got it. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah, sir. Yes, okay. Yeah, so I want my object, my, my JSON literal, to contain null. Okay, got it. Okay. So there's no way to just have formatting directives with play JSON, which is really annoying. You either have all of the magic or you have to do all of the work yourself. There's no in between, which to me is really silly. So I'm actually working on a side project. I'm trying to figure out how to bridge that gap. <laughs> um, but I think this is sort of the first step in that. So this is a compile time safe directive that says, here's a foo, generate me the formatter. So this is the actual uh, play JSON macro. Gen generate me a formatter for foo. Well, foo is a case class that has a bar. And this is an extension method that says, hey, if bar is a none, let's go do some magic, because I know how it's going to be written out. Let's, make, let's just make sure to write that key. This is the actual syntax that you use. And this is uh, a Scala symbol. If this name is wrong, your code doesn't compile. If bar as a field does not refer to an int, your or to an option, your code does not compile. And it's all because of this map. Ooh, goddamn it. <laughs> it's all because of this magic down here, where I can take the label generic of that case class, hold it, and just to walk you through what's happening here. So here's the key which is using a singleton type. So we actually lift our symbol uh, as a literal into a singleton type, and this is the witness of that. Don't worry about that. Hey, too much. <laughs> yeah, I know, we're already eyes glazed over. Uh, we get the label generic, so we basically break the fields apart. We say, give me the lens, that is, let me access the particular field within that broken apart tuple whose field is named the same as the key, which is basically what that says. Make sure that whatever the hell it's referred to is an option. Make sure that whatever is referred to, I actually have a formatter in scope for, because it could be an option of anything, right? Well, it has to be an option of something that I can write out, uh, so yeah. make sure that I have a type class that way. And this one is just some safety to make sure that instead of, uh, because you could do literals different ways, symbols or strings. This forces it to be a uh, must be a symbol. Must it's be a symbol. It's a requirement for and a symbol. And the reason for that is that if you put in a string, it'll compile, and it won't find it because of some weird shapeless limitation. Oh. And so you can have string of bar, and it won't work, but it will compile. So this forces so it to be a bar forces uh, and it's, is make shapeless find it. Yeah, and it's because when the, the label generic gets broken out, it's the singleton types are of symbol rather than string. Oh, I see. And they don't have a mapper for you to go yeah. across there. Oh, that's fine. Okay. So uh, is it safe to say that most of those types are, are they're not even used. They're just enforcing the compiler to they are almost like compiler time assertions or something. They are used because I have to write a proof. So it like pulls all of them through. Yeah. Okay. So like I have to take my object and turn it into something. So where's the EV one down there? Where's EV one being used? In uh, well, EV one really is just evidence. Oh, okay. All right. Got it. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess everybody's right. <laughs> <laughs> so what is interesting though is it looks like you use the naming convention of EV1, you use EV as stuff that is more evidence that's not yeah. necessarily part of your yeah, I don't need to use it for anything. Right, that's a great naming strategy. I love that. It's a great idea. And actually if you look at how this is implemented, there's nothing useful to this class. It's, it really is just evidence that it exists. Okay. Which by the way, this is in pre-def. Uh, this is the correct way for knowing that one type is a subtype of another type. Oh, really? Uh, there's also the opposite direction. equals colon equals, which says that one type is the same as the other type. Okay. If you try and do anything else, 
you're in for a world of hurt. <laughs> Tight classes is the way, right way to do this. And it's in pre-def, it's a standard way of doing it. It's cool. If you try and Google it, you're going to be in pain. <laughs> I tried to no do it. No kidding. Huh. I actually tried to do it today and it didn't work. It was really frustrating. It does not work with punching in quotes. No, uh, no, I actually punched in quotes and it didn't work. Huh. Weird. And, which, that was really weird. Okay. So hopefully that convince you, convinces you guys that this facility is really cool because that's like a really small way to write all of the code that you would have to over on the other yeah. side. Uh -huh. Some of the neat stuff, one of the neat libraries that I did a talk on recently was in Haskell land, revolved around a library called Servant. Servant. And what Servant allows you to do is basically specify the HTTP request at the type level. So in the type system itself, you specify what your API needs. I'm pretty sure you can do the same thing here from what it looks like. You can say my API type is say this route, which is defined by this URL plus this request. Oh, that's essentially what you're describing. What At least so far what I'm hearing you describe is what Spray.io is on um, on um, ACA, it's now HTTP. Is the API yeah. definition itself in the type system? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's really cool. And then you, then you can dynamically expand it as well. I mean, you can, it's not. You can add on to it. Yes. But it, if you add on anything, it's a new type then. Yes. No longer the old type. Well, there's a meta type called a magnet that you're extending primarily. Well, magnet patterns for something different. So. Oh, okay. Then I'll I'm take that back. put something on the board if you don't. Are we done with this? Are we? Is <laughs> oh, that it? I was going to look through this, but it doesn't really matter. So the, the only point here is that there are macros involved. Uh, Shapeless is generating stuff underneath. Oh, uh, so Shapeless has a macro that's extended at compile time that generates the code. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Is it, do you want to dive into it? No. I mean, it's really just more important that folks know what Shapeless is doing. Yeah, that's really for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Go ahead, Jonathan. You want to? Draw. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to show maybe like we could compare notes basically, see if it is sort of the same thing or not. Um, yeah, oops. I don't think. Um, the API would sort of be like, you know, my API, let's say, um, it takes, um, or it's foo, and then sort of. Request parameter that's int, and then we'll give it a value B or something, right? That's like a simple sort of thing. Okay. And it outputs um, type level list there would be JSON, XML, I should say, of some type uh, bar. Okay. So basically, if I hit uh, foo, or it should be. Yeah. Gotcha. Right. I do foo and I pass it a request parameter called v. That's some int that it returns type bar. That's either JSON. Yes. Or XML. That's what the, how, that's essentially how the right router works. So that's the type. Well, your function that implements that that has that type then has to equal some function. Um, you know, foo that takes n and returns either the type bar. Which is then has two type classes, or that's from JSON or XML. So this is a directive, and then you open a parenthesis, and you want to open a curly brace and close it, and then you're basically writing the function that it needs, and you supply um, the whatever the get, for example, say it was input parameters. Mm -hmm. Input parameters would sit here, and then you you're implementing the directive, um, and then the return value of that is uh, a route. So they call the route. Okay. And so, so and this. Oh, great! He's got a great. He's got an example of it. Yeah, there you go. And you're literally watching the DSL through types and type ram. Um, well, actually. Well, so what he's defining over there is a type, like his first yeah, name this. is type API. Uh huh. That's not what is going on over here. Like I don't That's actually. That's a DSL for saying how you get to your. Thing. Yeah, this is a DSL. I, I see. don't actually care. Like I know that the type at the end is going to be a route. Right. right. But I don't care how that really gets put yeah. together. So in this case, this return type of this thing is sort of, there's HTTP input, 
needs to be a get with this sort of path plus this parameter. This entire thing, that's the API definition. Yeah. And you can tack on other things uh, to this. I see what you're saying. Where you implement it separately. This is more a series of commands as methods, Thank really, you. and then here yeah, he's you. actually describing types. Of, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. So when you're showing the, the H list stuff, I was like, I'm pretty sure you could encode some of this stuff. At least Absolutely. Yeah. So if you there's the parameters directive, which usually uses an H list. Right. Um, uh, let me see if I can find it. <laughs> Parameters will at compile time be checked with that yes. function. Yes. And that actually uses H plus seven. Yeah. It's similar, not quite, because that's in the definition itself. Yep. So you could well, so the, the type here is inferred. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because of that inference, you can do that. Right, yeah. That's really cool, Mark. And so one of the things what I found really interesting with the server library is because you specify your entire API as your web routes and your inputs and your outputs, basically everything your API needs to work, and you can basically combine them with other routes, is that this type is inspectable you know, at compile time. Yeah. And your implementation, if it doesn't implement all of that, handle all of that, it's just going to yeah, you got compile time error instead of a runtime yeah. error out here missing some but that's, implementation But that's the thing that checks it is the, that's just the type checker, right? But yeah. because we have the type here, if now you say, I'm going to have a documentation type class, which then I'm going to have this be a member of, basically, yep. you can then say, is the request parameter in that has B, does it have documentation? Does bar have documentation? So then you can assert that at compile time that you provided docs for those things. Yeah, so that's the big failing of this, is that because the types get thrown away, you'd actually have to use a macro to walk the DSL to pull out any kind of documentation. But in this case, the types aren't available at runtime either. It's just all done at compile time. But like, so I'm assuming like the H list stuff that you're yeah, talking about. I mean, even can't that belong to a trait? Because everything gets rolled up to a route, there's there's no way to walk that type. Like it's just okay. an object now. Gotcha. And it has stuff. You can't know what it is. Got it. Okay. So yeah, this is way more powerful. But the the downside is that like Scala, so the type level compiler as of last week or the week before, mm -hmm. actually you can write this and it makes sense. Yeah. Um, Paul P. wrote, wrote a thing, uh, let me show that actually, that was another really cool thing. Um, it's the PSP link. Which if you guys haven't seen this, and if it doesn't change... Oh, I saw this go by. Did you not think that it was the coolest damn thing in the world? I didn't follow it. I scanned it went... Oh, okay. shit, I'm going to have to go deep think on this, and so I let it go. Okay, so I can explain what's going on. That'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, dogs, cats, and monkeys, at least in the type level compiler, those are now the singleton types. Square brackets, right? right. That's it's a, a value type. that is a type. Right, effectively. I, but it's more of a type that has one inhabitant. Right. And that it's a singleton type. Yeah. You're, have, you're promoting that value to its own type. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's oh, okay. That so, so it's a and value and a type. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, so all like, the languages they call them symbols or whatever. It's sort of similar. Well, and, and symbols actually have a singleton type as well. Yeah. So as do strings and literals and all that stuff. Pretty much any value. Yeah. yeah. So why is that important? Well, it happens to do with the niceties of Scala pattern matching syntax where this has to be an unapplied. So if you have multiple, if you have parens right here, 
you can't go instantiate a pattern matcher. Those parens apply to the things that the unapply returns, right? Because unapply returns yeah. an option of a tuple. Yes. Which then these are going to be bound to the things in that option if it returns. Right, right, right. So what happens if you try and implement string prefix or string suffix? Turns out you completely screwed the way that Scala syntax works. Because you have no way of passing in what the prefix or suffix is supposed to be on a, on a one line thing. Just, it's impossible to oh, do. Oh, I see. Okay. Which sucks. Mm -hmm. But now with this syntax, what I can do is I can say, uh, that's the prefix. And it looks right. Just so damn cool. I love it. So removes a type and prefix is a single instance class. Where, where, where so is so that, like where's that class live? Is it in the root scope? I mean, where's the, what package? So like if I would remove live, remove lives up in his PSP leaf So does dogs live there too now? No, dogs is a type. Right. So types always have a package prefix. What's its package prefix? Where does that type uh, live no, in the? It just in the type. Just in the type. Well, well, in, in Scala land, all types yeah, have a package, so it uh, and it could Scala be root. Dot lang dot, well, it wouldn't be Sorry. Right. Wait a minute. Yeah, it doesn't make, I didn't, I hope it's not root, but maybe it is it's, supposed to be. It'd be Scala dot lang dot string, because by the time you actually compile down, the singleton types are thrown away. Okay. So it, it's a very transitory so it's a special. Thing. it's a specialized type of string, or um, that's a sub, a sub package of string. It's a subtype of string, yeah. Okay. Fascinating. Well, it's dogs. But string is final. <laughs> well, but dogs is a subtype of string. It well, is, yeah. But string is final. How does it's that work? So is dogs. Right. Well, so but you can't, so you can't extend string. You, you wouldn't be able to extend dogs over there. So it turns out you don't care because that type gets thrown away when you generate your bytecode. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's, so, it's, it's so if I use dogs for, here and I use dogs somewhere else, oh, I obviously use will those be the same types? Yes. yes. Yes, they will be. They're both equal at type and at value. Yep. All right, because they're, right. okay. What? That's confusing. Because in this case, dogs is a type. Somewhere else, it's just a string, though. Well, I mean, if it was well, using a type that, context. If it was in the same context, then yes, it would be the same. But if it's a value and you wanted to get access to that type, you could, and it would be in the same type. Mm -hmm. So, like in. Oh, so you could do dot type on quote dogs quote? I can write this yeah. in, in Dottie. Val 2, two colon, colon two. 2 it has value 2. The type is 2 and the value is 2. Okay. Can you put 3 on the right side? No. Well, actually, today you can. It's a bug. Oh, but okay. <laughs> okay. Just trying to. So, so, why would you put equals 2 then? Why wouldn't you just you leave it off? Or because or if you leave this off, yeah. it gets promoted to int. No, 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 the other side. Val, Val to, why, why are you having, oh, I guess you got to assign something. There's type inference, right? Because, yeah, if you don't, yeah, assign if you don't have anything two, there, then. Right, I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. That's weird. Yeah, yeah that's a kind of weirdy, weird to think about. Yeah. Ask a land is called data kind. It's basically, that's data that gets promoted to. To a kind, to a type. Yeah, okay. And then you can pattern match on that because it's a type, not just yes. a value. Huh. But so, again, I guess I'm the only one that's done C++. In C++ templates, you can pass the literals into the templates. And so, for example, this is often used to generate uh, statically sized arrays. So you'll pass like two down into an array. You know that that array is always going to be a size two. Oh. Now you can do the same thing in Scala, and it looks right. Cool. cool. And you don't have to do the church numerals in Kevin, which yeah, sucks. So yeah, I wish more. Huh. I'm going to do a talk on server library in the Java user group in November. That should be fun. Basically, the premise is the gist of it is if we can do all this stuff at the type level, it enables us to do a whole lot more. Because in the server library, for example, yes, now you can do type check documentation, whether you have provided something. Whether it's quality or not, that's up to whomever. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Uh, but then you can also, because you have all the input parameters and what the output parameters are, they can generate all your client code for free. You can generate JavaScript stuff. You can 
generate pure script, LM, C sharp, what the heck ever you want, because you have all the inputs and what the outputs are and what the types are as well, whether it's JSON or XML, and then you can, if you have quick check or arbitrary stuff, Scala gen stuff, you can generate random crap and say, here's an example of this type. Huh. I think the more libraries should move in that direction, so that just makes that a lot easier to that's do. On the, on the, I'd say that's quite a bit of abstraction there for um, the average IT guy that I've met to, to deal with. <laughs> I think this is where the, the barrier to entry gets really high for Scala. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, you know, with this kind of stuff, if you, the definition you showed, right, it's easy to read. Yep, and that's the point. Yeah, that's how stuff should be moving in. Yeah, I think it is. The Scala's getting really good at option, so. All right, I've got to go. I'm 30 minutes late. Dang it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what are you late for? Yeah, I've got to